Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, good day. God be unto you. I'm glad you're here. This is week two of the Say What for Real Bible Study, a Bible study that looks at using the Gospel of Mark to um, see how we do relationships, how we understand our relationships, not just our spousal, our marital, our um, partner relationships, but also how we understand the relationships that we find ourselves involved in um, in society in general, or around and around the table, around conversations, um, how we treat our neighbor, how we treat our friend, how we treat the people that live next door, how do we treat the people that we sit beside in church, uh, ride the bus beside, um, our Uber driver, uh, you know, how, how do we treat the lady at the grocery store, the young girl that um, works the cash register in the dollar store that no one ever speaks to. Everyone just hands the money, gets their products, and never looks eye to eye. How, how do we treat our own children, our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews, um, the children in our ministry programs? Um, how do we do relationships? Um, that's what this looks at. And today we jump into the text. This, this, um, we, we're not going to just do, you know, Bible study where everybody just talks. We're going to literally look at the text. Um, hopefully you got the reading assignment. Hopefully you filled out this survey. Well, surveys are important. They'll come from time to time um, by Google survey, Google form, just asking you, did you enjoy the Bible study? Um, what would you have changed? Or Similar questions to that. Do you see yourself as marginalized? I think was the question this week. Um, do you see yourself on the margins? Um, and what does that mean? So um, do, ma'am, and do, sir, take the time to fill out the surveys. Um, hope everybody has finally by now received the email with the um, outline for our time together for at least the um, first five sessions. Um, if you have not received the email, please shoot me an email and say, hey, I didn't get the email. I want the email. I want the outline so that you can have the full outline of what we discuss and how we discuss it. Um, session two starts with the gospel according to Mark, and, and I'd love to jump right into it at this time. I'm going to screen share right now so um, you all can see the outline, I think it is, that we have um, for this week. The um, as far as that goes, and, and we work from there. Um, the outline for the Say What Bible Study, for real, following our introduction. Last week we talked about locating Mark, locating ourselves, the text we will read, the reading we understand. Tonight, session one, the kingdom of God has drawn near. Uh -huh. And don't get all religious and all uptight about us starting to use kingdom language. Um, kingdom of God simply means ruling God's area, God's ruling area, the area, the space, the presence of God rules. If we think of God as all powerful, then whenever God comes into our midst, into our kingdom, into our environment, then his all powerful nature makes wherever he is his kingdom. Um, there's a lot of folk that want to get confused and say, well, what does it mean that the kingdom of God is coming? Well, um, basically, when we start talking about kingdom of God, we're talking about the place where God is ruling. And wherever God is, God rules. Um, it's just like if you're sitting in a meeting and someone of more esteem or more principal walks in, then it becomes their meeting. If you're at a company and you are the vice chair and the vice president of the company comes in, then whatever that vice president has to say is their meeting now. If you are the um, associate pastor and the senior pastor stops into the Bible study, whatever else, that is, it becomes his meeting. If you are the under shepherd and the shepherd comes into the environment, then all of a sudden, they become in charge. Well, it's the same thing. Where, wherever we are and God comes in, then God is now in control. 
So tonight, hopefully, we'll, we'll today, wherever it is, whatever, we'll li- deal with repentance. What is our understanding of repentance? We'll deal with Jesus is baptized by John the baptizer. We'll deal with Jesus of Nazareth is driven into the wilderness. And we'll deal with Jesus proclaims the kingdom of God in Galilee. And lastly, probably most fun, we'll deal with the um, exercises, Jesus exercises a demon. Jesus exercises a demon. So that's pretty much the outline for um, where we'll be at today. And we will be dealing with Mark's gospel uh, um, 1 through 45. Mark's gospel 1 through 45. Let's go to the text at this time and see the text itself. Um, Okay, so let's see if we can get this to share our um, Bible study app part. Um, Let's see if we can get this to pull up our desktop. Go to desktop, hit share, sharing desktop, back to Safari. And we are in Mark. And let's say one. And let's go one through uh, 15. One through five. Well, let's try one through 15 to start with. And we'll go from there and see how it works. Uh, let's just log in. I wanted to show you this part just so you all will be aware um, of the Bible Gateway app. And it's already part of my Facebook. So we'll just log in with Facebook and go from there. Um, hopefully it logs in. <laughs> um, You know, one of the things about this Bible study, I was telling one of my pastor friends, I was like, you know, I want to do this because I I want to um, really, let's type that again, um, get my members not to be afraid of the technology. Um, So part of this lesson will be our learning to use this technology um, that is so readily available for us to do the work of God and to reach persons in the salvation and, and move people forward to where God is in our lives. Um, and here we are. We, we have our text pulled up. And the text is from Mark 1, 1 through 10. is probably where we start. We may need more of it later on. But the text really simply reads, The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as written in the prophet Isaiah and we open this gospel of Mark with this proclamation from Isaiah stating that, um, see, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his path. When you see that, we automatically oftentimes jump to Jesus. But if you read it as it's saying, it's saying, um, that he goes out in the wilderness to prepare what? What is he preparing? He's preparing the way of the Lord. He's preparing an opening for God to come into our lives. And um, that, this literally, when I, when I say let's look at the text and without a lot of preconceptions of, you know, if you look at this text from Isaiah, what is the messenger doing? Preparing, you will prepare your way. A voice came out crying in the wilderness. and What is he preparing? He's preparing the way of the Lord. I mean, that's what the text says, preparing the way of the Lord. Um, And I I think we need to look at the text. So instead of interpolating this as he's going out to prepare the way for Jesus, maybe we need to look at what it says, and he's literally going to prepare the way of the Lord to make God's pathway straight. And who's doing that? I'm glad you asked. John the baptizer. Um, Don't think we need to miss that either because so many times I think we miss the idea of what people do. What is John? Well, we want to go into the, the story. John is a prophet. John was a messenger. John was this. Um, 
according to the text. Once again, you know, not, not so much a, a literal reading of the text, but what is the text saying? It's saying John the baptizer. If I say, yeah, I have a friend named Ted and he's an elephant trainer, and I say he's Ted the elephant trainer, then when you meet Ted, what does Ted do? Trains elephants, right? So here's John the baptizer. What does John do? He, he baptizes, um, and folk were coming from, where were they coming from? The cities? Not, well, not really. It says, what? It says, what, what does it say? The countryside. Folk were coming from the countryside to see John, to see what he was up to, to see what John was uh, there. John had on this, this, this baptizing uniform. Clothed in camel's hair, level around and ate wild honey, you know, this 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 arrogant, you know, out in the wilderness type of guy. Because where was John working? In the wilderness. That's key. That's gonna be key to our understanding of this particular text. Um, and John was being a baptizer, doing baptism. That's what he was all about. And then we get into this understanding, well, what happens in the text? Well, Jesus comes to be baptized in the Jordan by John. And this, is, this may be our focus um, tonight and maybe something good for us to focus on in time to come. And it says simply, as he came up out of the water, as he came up out of the water, he's experiencing this, this encounter with where we are. He's experienced what God is able to do. And look at the text. This is coming out of the water. He saw the heavens torn open. Um, one of the things I really like about that is, you know, for John's, for Mark's gospel, when John the Baptist has this encounter, um, there was this understanding that, you know, heaven was this cosmic curtain that separated humanity from God. Heaven, heaven, you know, we see it in our own tradition. I want to get to heaven. I got to get to heaven. You know, kids ponder from the earliest existence of God. Well, how do I get to God? Well, God, where is God at? God is in heaven. How do I get to heaven? Well, you got to go up to heaven. You got to go through to heaven. You, there was this big curtain that separated us from God. And unlike the other Gospels, what we see here in this Gospel is the curtain is torn open. Um, the Greek word there means schism. Um, you know, the, the, the word is schizos, um, S-C-H-I-Z-O, but it means schizos, torn open. And that's important on several reasons because traditionally, what has been thought of is um, when the heavens tore open, um, human beings have access to God. You know, and that's, that's the traditional understanding of it. Um, and Mark's gospel is different even in this point in the story because what happens for us here is in the other gospels, we have this grand pronouncement of God saying, this is my son, but if you look at this gospel, the focus may be less on the grand pronouncement because this is said to Jesus. Um, it's said to Jesus. This is spoken to Jesus. It's, it's spoken um, almost in, 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 you know, as, as an expense. Let's see if we expand this chapter a little bit. Um, it's spoken... Almost, you know, in, in a sense that um, what we have here is, and it doesn't want to listen. Are you going to open that for us? Yeah. Here we go. What we have here is the spirit, um, the voice came from heaven, you are my son of whom I am well pleased. Um but it doesn't seem like that voice is coming to everybody. It seems like this is more to Jesus. It's spoken directly and, and closely to Jesus. Um, and and that, that's, that's, that's kind of important. Um, 
even if you look at it, I wanted to go to another translation, even if you look at it in the NIV translation of that very same text, when we get there, um, it, it really seems to indicate just as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw the heavenly being being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. It, it, it almost makes it like this is a personal experience with Jesus and God as they're coming up out of the water as this is happening. Um, and, and to me, that's important because I like the personal understanding. I like um, the, the personal interaction of it. Um, even in this translation that I don't use that much. Um, you also see the, the idea then as he's immediately when he was coming out of the water, the King James says, then the voice came of heaven, you are my son in whom I am well pleased. So, so we, we still get that same encounter, that same understanding that we are there. Um, and then we get into this whole episode of, you know, if God can step in, if we can gain access to God, can't God step in? See, when you start to talk of the veil of heaven, this covering of heaven being opened up, when you start to look at that nature, then you can also see, um, as some scholars would say, um, it may also be a, 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 a it may also be an understanding that God is no longer trapped into sacred spaces. What what we do when we separate ourselves from God is we we put God in a box and, and God must stay in that box. If the box is broken, when Jesus comes up out of water, if the, the box is broken now, then it also means God can get out of the traps that we place God in. You know, we, we have this imagery that God is stuck up in the heavens. But if at the baptism of Christ, the heavens are opened up, then God can be wherever God wants to be. Now, why is that important? Because the whole premise for our understanding is that wherever God is, there is the kingdom. Because wherever God goes, he's ruling. So as soon as we have the box open, then God can go anywhere. So God is no longer limited to our small, sacred, little spaces of God. Now God can move outside of the hospital, out of the church. You can find God in, in the club, in the grocery store. You, you can find God anywhere. God can be at the baseball game. God can be on the football field. God can be at the Hooters. God can be um, in the Walmart. God can be at the Pizza Hut. God. And wherever God is, he's in control. God can even be in my wilderness experiences. So as I start to repent, I'm not repenting. You see, one of the things that we may have looked in Mark's gospel is repentance for Mark is different. For Mark, repentance is not so much, oh, I did something wrong. Let me tell you about what I did wrong. You know, we've got this tradition in the church where repentance is limited to what I did wrong. Let me tell you about what I did wrong and you fix it. Oh, but if we, we expand this thing and open it up, what we, what we truly see is that it becomes a story of not so much what I did wrong or let me fix it, but how do I turn around the situation? For, for what, we, what we truly see in this gospel, what we truly see in this text is an understanding that, you know, the spirit... Um, moves us to say yes to God, moves us to engage God on, on such a level where we, we're doing and seeing things different, where we're doing and seeing, you know, what it means to repent, what it means to, to draw to God, what it means to, for, for Mark, what repentance really means is um, 
how do I go the way that God would have me to go? Not so much that I've, I've seen things and done things or what I've seen and what I've done, but for Mark's gospel, repentance really means seeing things a different way. And if I see things a different way, I'll do things a different way. So if I'm in this setting, say I'm in this setting and God is in the setting, in the sacred space also, then where God is, I see things differently. So even in our wilderness experiences, God is engaged. And if God is engaged and in control, let's look at the text. Let's look, look here. Immediately he's in the wilderness. So he, he goes in the wilderness. He's in the wilderness now. All right, out in the wilderness. So what is God doing? God has him out in the wilderness. He's out in the wilderness. And he's out there for 40 days. Tempted by Satan, he, and he was with the wild beast. I've always gotten that. I've, 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 every time I think about this, this text, and you all read this text, every time we think about him being out in the wilderness for 40 days, we get the wild beast. Yes, the wild beast were out there. He was out there. But what we miss is this little section here. And the angels waited on him. Oh, when I got that, I was like, aha, for real? Because what does that mean? First of all, what are angels? Angels are messengers of God. They carry the message of God. Okay, so we got that. Secondly, um, angels don't have an ability to do their own. Unlike humans with free will, Angels do what God says do. So the angels weren't sitting up there saying, oh, look at the poor little Jesus. Let us go help Jesus. No. God sent those angels to minister to Jesus while he was in the wilderness. God provided help. God provided tools. God provided company relationships, relational beings when Jesus was in his wilderness. So if God provides relational beings for Jesus, if God provides helpmates for Jesus, if God provides folk to be in relation with Jesus in his wilderness, then wouldn't you expect God to also provide for you in your wilderness experiences, and if God can provide in wilderness experiences, if God is no longer locked in the box, then anywhere you are, God can provide for you. Even if he must use surrogates, helpers, people, relationships. So, 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 the gift here is if we free God from the box, if we allow God's, the heavens to be open, free God from the box, then the angels can minister to us wherever we are, and not just the angels, but any relationship God chooses to, any beings God chooses to have in relationship with you, can minister to you even at your most wilderness experiences. And I think we've all been through some wilderness experiences if we hadn't just hold on, because wildernesses do come. Um, let's move into the text a little bit because we're running short on time. Now, after um, Jesus was, after John was arrested, so we have this narrative with John. We're not even going to get into that too much. Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news. And what was his good news? The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Why is that key again? Because once again, we said the kingdom of God. In other words, God is in ruling. God is ruling now. This is a space where God is ruling. This is how God rules. You need to follow the rules of God. And as soon as he, you know, what that means is he's bringing that to the people. He's bringing that to these rural farming-like people to tell them, hey, 
God is the ruler now. Don't worry about this other rulers and other thing. God is ruling and where God is ruling his justice, his, his, his abilities will be fulfilled. Let me show you how God feels. So miracles become a showing that God is present. Healings become not so much come God and heal this person, but let me show you that God is present. Feedings become not so much let me find the food to feed you. Let me set up the government programs to feed you. But no, let me show you how when God rules, things are different. And who does he get but these fishermen to follow him? Um, one of the understandings with that is he didn't choose the best of the best. He didn't choose the elite, the political astute. He didn't go to the high priest. Um, these were folk. They were rabbis. They, they had been trained as rabbis as babies because in the Jewish society from six to eight, you, tr you start your rabbi training. You start to learn the Torah. You start to memorize it. Then from eight to, to 12, you, 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 you start to, if you move forward, you start to learn the Torah even in detail. And, and from six to eight, you go through Genesis to um, Deuteronomy and, you know, in rabbinic tradition from, um, you know, that time forward, you're, you're called to memorize from Genesis to Malachi, and the best of the best are assigned or, or have a rabbi to pick them, and they go into rabbi training. But at that point, 15, 16 years old, if, if you just not one of the best of the students or no rabbi trains you, you go back home and you do your family business. And um, these fishermen, Apparently they hadn't been picked as rabbi students. So they're out there in the family business, doing, doing the family stuff, fishing for fish. And Jesus chooses them because what Jesus is different from any other rabbi, Jesus is saying, you can do what I do. You can follow me. Come follow me. Come follow me. And there begins the, the spread of the gospel as these disciples embrace Jesus and leave their family, their trade, to go into ministry. Why is that key? Because the calling in the ministry pushes them to do more unusual things. But then you've got something else here. This unclean spirit. Man with the unclean spirit in verse 21 um, they were in Capernaum, and it was on Sabbath day. He came and entered the synagogue and taught. Um, I always tickle me when people say Jesus never taught in the church. Um, several times in Scripture, we see Jesus following Sunday mandates and going into the temple to teach. And as he was teaching this time, they were all astonished by his authority and his abilities to teach. Um, but just then, there was a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know you are the Holy One of God. So in, in other words, this demonic, this, this demon-possessed God, this guy who our text says unclean spirit, demon-possessed, whose mind was gone. Some force of evil understood that the kingdom had changed, that this was no longer the kingdom of the world. This was now God's kingdom. And he asked, okay, what's the rules now? How, how do we do this now? If God is in control of this kingdom, what does that mean now for our life? Once again, we see, you know, in this training, in this teaching, an understanding that God is in the business. God is in folk business. God is in the picture. God is right here. And he's asking Jesus, okay, what does that mean for me now? I was ruling this place. I was ruling this situation. But now, Jesus, you're here. 
Now God's rules, God's policies are in place. And I think sometimes we miss that. I, I think sometimes we miss this whole understanding of what Jesus was teaching. Jesus is teaching that the kingdom is here. So if Jesus is teaching the kingdom is here, that means God is in control. God is in control, then that means the White House is not in control. If God is in control, that means the medical professionals are not in control. If God is in control, that means what? God is in control. And if God is in control, that means he has the right to proceed to the purpose. He, he, he's doing what needs to be done. Then we see quite clearly that with God in control, things are going to change. And even demons must flee. And where we make our mistakes sometimes is we allow demons to stay in people and think that they're going to act like God. We allow people to have evil habits, evil, evil intentions, evil will, evil plans and procedures, and we want them to act like God. Unless that unclean spirit, unless that demon possession is put out of the kingdom, then the kingdom is, you know, God, God is not going to allow evil to rule his kingdom because it's God's kingdom. And what we have to realize is either you're a kingdom citizen or you're not. You're either in the kingdom or you're not in the kingdom. And many times, many of us, have refused to be in the kingdom, and that's why we don't see what happens. So when they go to Simon's house, Jesus is quick to be able to put out sickness because sickness isn't part of is not he is in room, he's in, he's he's in control. And sickness is not to have authority where God is having authority. So if the house is made whole, sickness can be put out. We, we immediately see him being able to put out leprosy, you know, to stretch and touch people, to cleanse, to bring health care, to bring in health care, to bring in healing, to bring in deliverance. Why? Because God is in control. So, I mean, you know, what we see in that is an understanding that when we take God at face value and in control, God can use even the relationships we're in to make a real difference. Even the environments, the situations we're in, to make a real difference. So, um, I'm sure time is up. I think this has been a good engagement. Um, I, I think you all have a good start to where we are. Um, and I think, you know, basically we can move forward in it. The reading assignment for the next time that we gather will be uh, Mark's Gospel, the second chapter, one through the third chapter, verse six. Oh, it's going to be a good one because we're going to start to deal with the idea of women and that whole narrative as well as the idea of shame and sin. Um, so I'm looking forward to being with you all next time. Let's close in prayer. Um, sweet Heavenly Father, sweet Heavenly Mother, sweet God, teach and train and develop in us an understanding of the scriptures that we may be able to improve our life and our lifestyles. In the name of heaven, we pray. Amen.